Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you back to Midnight Stories, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the tale. But before that, please consider giving us a like. We're three hours into our forest hike. My boots are muddy, and my backpack feels heavier than when we started. I'm with my friends David, Emily, Mark, and Katie. Our goal is simple. Find an adventure that goes beyond the well-trodden trails and crowded overlooks. We want something different, something memorable. David, who's been leading the way, suddenly stops and points. Hey guys, look at this, he says, drawing our attention to a path that veers off to our right. This path is narrow and hidden by overgrown bushes, tall grass, and hanging tree limbs. You could walk right past it and not notice it's there. Katie takes her phone out and opens her map app. It's not on the map, she says, holding the screen so we can see. Her face is puzzled but also intrigued. Mark's eyes widen, clearly excited by this new development. Should we check it out, he asks, almost as if he's hoping we'll say yes. I can feel a tingle of anticipation spreading through the group. I'm caught in it too, and I say, let's do it, we're here for an adventure, right? The atmosphere is charged with a mix of excitement and curiosity, making the air feel electric. We make our way through the overgrowth pushing aside thorny branches and stepping over uneven terrain that feels like it hasn't been touched in decades. Our clothes catch on twigs, and we hear the fabric tear slightly in places. We take turns hacking away at the obstructing foliage with a small machete Mark had brought along just in case. After navigating this hidden path for about twenty minutes, we emerge from the dense forest into an open area. What we see next stops us all in our tracks. The city sprawls in front of us, covering at least several square miles. The architecture is a blend of styles we can't easily place, as if multiple eras and cultures contributed to its design. Made of a stone that has a slight iridescent quality, shimmering in the dappled sunlight. These structures are decorated with intricate carvings, featuring designs that range from geometric patterns to lifelike depictions of animals and faces. Columns with ornate capitals support entryways and large plazas are centered around fountains that no longer flow, but still stand in immaculate condition. The cobblestone streets are narrow and winding, laid out in an organic way that suggests the city grew naturally over time rather than being planned. Despite the lack of maintenance, there is no moss or overgrowth. The stone surfaces are clean and devoid of dirt. Not a single building shows signs of decay. The rooftops are intact, windows clear, and walls solid. Wow, Emily says, her voice barely above a whisper. She looks around, visibly trying to process the sight before us. Mark is already taking out his DSLR camera, adjusting the lens with eager hands. I can't believe it, he mutters, mostly to himself, as he starts snapping pictures, trying to capture the grandeur in a frame. What era does this even look like? Roman? No, older than that. Maybe Mesopotamian or something else entirely? Mark wonders aloud, his camera momentarily forgotten as he scans the buildings. It's hard to say, Katie replies. It could be thousands of years old, but look at it, it's pristine. The city gives off an aura of timelessness, yet it feels aged. Our best guess is that it's ancient, possibly predating any civilizations we learned about in history class. And yet it stands as if new, untouched by the passage of time, creating a disconnect between what we see and what we feel. Despite the awe-inspiring sight, an unsettling quiet pervades the city. There's no movement other than the occasional wind rustling through what looks like ancient banners hanging from the structures. No people, no animals, and even the wind seems to move in hushed tones. The atmosphere is filled with an eerie silence that makes our excitement waver, replaced by a tingling sense of caution. Don't you think it's strange, a city this grand in such good condition? But there's no one here. Katie says. It is odd, I agree, but maybe that's why it's in such good shape. No one's here to ruin it. As we step onto the cobblestone streets of the city, the sound of our footsteps echoes off the ancient stone walls that surround us. The buildings loom above, casting intermittent shadows as the sun starts its descent. David, who's always had a knack for leadership, takes the point, guiding us deeper into the city. Mark and Emily are right behind him, cameras in hand. Katie and I are at the back, keeping an eye out for anything unusual. The further we walk, the stronger the sensation becomes that we're not alone. 
although no one else is in sight. We come across a small square flanked by buildings with balconies overlooking the area. At the center are multiple stone statues, each one carved with an unsettling amount of detail. These figures aren't the stoic or heroic statues one would expect. Instead, their faces are contorted into expressions of unmistakable fear and despair. Eyes wide, mouths open in what looks like a silent scream. Each one is unique but equally disconcerting. Look at these statues, Mark says, snapping a few pictures but keeping a respectful distance. Emily examines them closely, then takes a step back. Yeah, those are creepy, she says, a shiver running down her spine. It's so odd. Why would anyone create statues that look so terrified? We make our way further into the city and finally arrive at a large square that appears to be its center. The space is open, surrounded by towering structures with balconies that offer a bird's eye view of the area. Dominating the square is a colossal statue of what appears to be a deity. The statue is meticulously carved, with complex patterns carved into its robe and an elaborate crown adorning its head. The eyes of the deity are inlaid with some type of reflective stone, giving them an eerily lifelike quality. David is practically buzzing with excitement as he takes photos from different angles. Guys, this is a once-in-a-lifetime discovery, he exclaims as he circles the statue, capturing its astonishing details. Emily, on the other hand, seems uneasy. But why is it so quiet? She questions, her voice dropping to a whisper. And does anyone else feel like we're being watched? It's unsettling. I feel it too, I admit, looking around the square as if expecting to catch sight of someone or something observing us. A shiver courses down my spine and I tighten the straps of my backpack reflexively. Katie looks around, her eyes meeting each of ours in turn. Yeah, this place is incredible, but I have to agree it's giving me the creeps. The silence is just too... intense. After a moment of shared glances and nods, we collectively decide to explore some more before making our way back. However, as we voice this agreement, an uneasy thought creeps into my mind. I can't shake the feeling that we've become entangled in something much bigger than ourselves, something we can't comprehend. For the first time since stumbling upon this hidden city, I find myself questioning the wisdom of our adventurous detour. We walk through the city, captivated by the complexity of the architecture. The buildings are tall and imposing, made of a unique stone that resembles marble but with an otherworldly sheen. David can't stop taking photos, and every now and then he shows us a shot that captures the essence of this mysterious place. Think of what an archaeologist or historian would give to see this, David says, switching the lens on his camera. But the more important question is, why haven't they? How could a place like this stay hidden, I ask, my eyes scanning the elaborate facades. As we navigate the winding cobblestone streets, the numerous unsettling statues are increasingly hard to ignore. Unlike standard sculptures that one might find in a typical city, these figures are incredibly lifelike, with detailed expressions of dread on their faces. The statues appear at regular intervals, some solo and others in groups, as if they were citizens of this city stopped in time. Lining the streets and windows tucked away in corners, these statues are really everywhere, aren't they? Emily says, her voice tinged with concern. Yes, it's as if they were part of everyday life here. Until whatever happened, happened, Mark comments, his eyes resting on a statue of what appears to be a family cowering together. David puts his camera down for a moment. The craftsmanship is exceptional. I wonder if these were residents or just artistic depictions. Katie chimes in. Well, either way, it's pretty unsettling, especially considering we don't know who made them or why they look so afraid. We continue to move through the streets, but the sense of awe is slowly overshadowed by a growing feeling of discomfort, her eyes narrowing at a statue of a woman clutching a child to her chest. Both the woman and child have faces are twisted in horror. Katie steps closer, her face reflecting the mix of fascination and dread we all feel. It's incredibly detailed, but also terrifying. The artist captured fear so realistically. What could have possibly happened here to make them create something like this? Before we can even start to speculate, Mark interrupts, looking perplexed at his handheld GPS unit. Something's off. According to this, we're just in an empty expanse. No city, no forest, nothing. 
I pull out my phone and navigate to my Maps app, only to find it glitching, unable to pinpoint our location. You're not alone, Mark. My GPS is also broken. And is anyone else's battery draining unusually fast? That's strange. My phone's battery is at 20% and it was nearly full when we left, Katie says, showing us her screen as proof. David looks at his phone and frowns. Same here. By now we're all on edge. What started as an exciting adventure is starting to feel like a trap. The feeling that we're being watched is intensifying. My skin tingles and I notice everyone else seems to be fighting off shivers. We exchange glances, each of us grappling with a growing sense of alarm. Whatever curiosity we had is now tinged with a caution that borders on fear. We make an unspoken agreement to stay close, very close, as we continue to explore what is clearly no ordinary city. And then we start hearing them, soft whispers that fill the silence, almost like the wind but more structured, like muffled conversations. Indecipherable words weave through the air and we can't locate their origin. It's as if the city itself is speaking to us. Footsteps echo behind us, a syncopated rhythm that aligns too perfectly to be random forest noises. We spin around simultaneously, expecting to see someone, but the cobblestone street is empty. No animal, no person, just the eerie statues that line the path. Did anyone else hear that? Mark asks. His eyes are wide and his voice an octave higher than usual. Emily nods, her gaze flitting from one shadowy corner to another. Yes, whispers and footsteps, right? And yet, there's no one else here except us. It's like we're in a ghost town, but more unsettling. David holds his camera tightly, as if it could serve as a shield. We need to understand what's happening, and fast, he says. You're right, David, but how do we do that? I respond, the weight of our situation settling over me. Our GPS and phones aren't working. It's not like this city came with a guidebook or warning signs. We're flying blind here. Our eyes meet, and we all know that whatever excitement we felt at first has now turned into a shared apprehension. As we stand there, pondering our next move, a sudden gust of wind sweeps through the city. It's strange almost unnatural and it sends shivers down my spine. The statues seem to watch us more intently, their stone eyes almost accusatory. Okay, this is too much. We need to leave, Katie says, her voice tinged with fear. But we've just scratched the surface, David protests. Think about what we could discover. I weigh the options in my mind. On one hand, this place is a treasure trove of unknown history and architecture, a discovery that any explorer would kill for. On the other, the city is unsettling, filled with fearful statues, unexplained phenomena, and the increasing sense that we're not alone. Let's stick to the original plan, I finally say. We'll explore for a few more minutes, but if anything else strange happens, we're out of here. Agreed? Everyone nods, albeit reluctantly. And we continue our exploration. We continue walking through the twisting maze-like streets of the city. My eyes catch a building that stands out from the rest. Its entrance has an arched doorway, and the pillars flanking it are covered in detailed carvings that look like a blend of floral and geometric patterns. Hey, look at this, I alert the group, pointing toward the intriguing building. It doesn't look like the other structures around here, does it? David steps closer, holding his camera up, ready to capture the moment. You're right, this place is special. Let's see what's inside. As we step through the arched entrance, the atmosphere changes. It's cooler and has a feeling of contained energy. We find ourselves in a room that immediately reminds me of an ancient library or study room. Several stone tables are in the middle of the room, meticulously aligned, as if waiting for scholars who will never return. What captures our attention most, however, are the walls. They are not just simple stone walls. They are canvases filled with inscriptions. The script engraved into the stone is nothing like any of us have ever seen. The lines curve gracefully, intertwined with symbols that look neither alphabetical nor numerical. Emily steps closer to the inscriptions, visibly puzzled. This doesn't look like any language I've seen. It's as if someone took the concept of writing and entirely reinvented it. Mark pulls out his notebook, sketching some of the symbols. We need to document this. Who knows what kind of information is hidden here? Katie keeps her distance from the walls, eyeing them cautiously. As captivating as this is, it's also kind of eerie. 
Do we even have the right to uncover what's been hidden here for so long? We all look at each other. Each pondering Katie's ethical question, but also equally enticed by the room's promise of long-forgotten knowledge. David lowers his camera for a moment, also caught in the tension between awe and caution. Well, one thing's for sure. This room is a discovery that poses more questions than answers. Feeling uneasy, we finish taking photos of the inscriptions and exit the building. No one speaks much as we make our way back to the central square to set up camp. The atmosphere is charged with tension and we can all feel it. It's as if the city itself is weighing on us. David breaks the silence as he starts to unpack the tent equipment. I can't believe what we've found, but the quicker we set up, the quicker we can rest and think through all of this. Mark and Emily are already spreading out their tent's ground tarp nearby. Let's get this done. I'm not comfortable spending more time here than we have to, his voice carrying a note of urgency. Katie unpacks her sleeping bag and unrolls it inside her tent with brisk movements. I hope we have a peaceful night. This place doesn't exactly exude calm. As we stake down the last of the tents and secure the zippers, everyone exchanges glances. It's clear that while the central square is breathtaking with its large open space and towering deity statue, it also feels like the most exposed and vulnerable place we could be in this eerie city. Finally, our camp is set up. Despite the beautiful buildings that surround us and the historical importance of our discovery, we're all feeling the heaviness of the situation. The city's architecture, the haunting statues, the mysterious inscriptions and the malfunctioning electronics have left us all feeling a bit on edge. We gather together for a quick meal of packaged camping food. As we eat, not much is said, and it's clear that we're all thinking about the unanswered questions surrounding this place. We finish eating and agree it's time to turn in for the night, each hoping that dawn brings more clarity than the setting sun. The tension is overwhelming as we gather outside our tents. Mark's flashlight beam darts around nervously, barely piercing the thick darkness that envelops the central square. Did anyone hear anything before Mark shouted, I ask, my own flashlight in hand? No, nothing, just that eerie silence, Emily responds, her voice tinged with anxiety. Katie is busy checking the ground near David's open tent. Look here, footprints, but they're not like any shoes we're wearing, she says, pointing to a set of marks that look unnaturally large and oddly shaped. A sense of dread fills the air as we ponder the implications. So what does that mean? Did something take him or did he walk off? Mark asks, his voice rising in pitch. I don't know, but standing here isn't helping. Let's split into pairs and search. We'll cover more ground that way, I suggest, my own sense of urgency escalating. Agreeing to stick close to the central square and not stray too far, we divide into teams. Mark and Emily go towards the eastern section. Katie and I choose the western section, where we had seen an unsettling number of those fear-stricken statues. Our flashlights illuminate snippets of our surroundings as we walk, the beams glinting off the statues that now feel even more menacing. Each shout for David echoes through the city but is met with oppressive silence. The feeling that we're being watched intensifies, making me grip my flashlight tighter. After what feels like an agonizing eternity, we converge back at the central square. No one has found any sign of David, but Katie is holding something up. It's David's camera, and it's found near one of the most haunting statues. A man with his face twisted in unimaginable terror. I found this just lying there, next to that statue, Katie says her voice barely above a whisper. The realization hits us all at once. David is missing in a city filled with statues depicting fear and terror. And now his camera shows up near one of those very statues. We're scared, puzzled, and above all desperate to find our missing friend. But as we stand there, flashlights in hand and hearts pounding, it's clear that the city holds more mysteries and dangers than we could have ever imagined. This is bad, really bad, Katie says her words heavy with dread. Mark takes the camera from Katie's hands. I think we need to accept that David might not be okay. A cold wave of realization washes over me. We're in danger. The warning signs have been clear, but we chose to ignore them. Now one of us is missing, and it's clear that we're not welcome here. Guys, we need to get out of here. Right now, I say, my voice carrying a new sense of urgency. The rest of the group nods. Their faces pale in the flashlight's beam. As we start to pack up our camp hurriedly, 
I can't help but feel that we're still being watched. Each fold of the fabric, each click of a buckle, sounds unusually loud in the oppressive silence. Mark and Emily pack up their camp gear quickly. Katie stands guard, her flashlight scanning the dark corners and alleys that surround the central square, her voice betraying a hint of apprehension. Agreed, Mark replies, his face still showing signs of distress over David's disappearance. As we shoulder our backpacks and start walking toward what we think is the city's exit, I take a final look at the mysterious building where we found the inscriptions. Our footsteps echo on the stone-paved streets, merging with the indistinct whispers that seem to emanate from the walls themselves. I think about David. His excitement over this expedition was infectious, but now he's gone, leaving a void that's palpable in each one of us. It's as if the city is sending us a clear signal, one that screams for us to leave while we still can. Suddenly, Katie stops abruptly, causing me to bump into her. Do you hear that? She asks, her voice tinged with worry. Before anyone can answer, we all notice it. A low hum that seems to vibrate through the ground, as if the city is resonating with a frequency of its own. It adds another layer to the eerie feeling that we've overstayed our welcome. Let's keep moving, Mark finally says, breaking the momentary silence. As we navigate through the winding streets, every statue we pass seems to glare at us, their stone eyes almost following our movement. I lead the way as we try to backtrack toward the forest, place where this all began. Mark is right behind me, his flashlight darting back and forth nervously. Katie follows, her own beam of light scanning the ground, as if expecting it to open up beneath her at any moment. Emily brings up the rear. Wait, this can't be right, I say, stopping at an intersection that wasn't there before. What's going on? Mark asks, his voice tinged with a rising sense of dread. I don't know, this layout, it's not the same. Streets are missing or changed, I reply. Are you sure? Katie joins in. Could we have taken a wrong turn? I'm certain. The statue of the two warriors was right here. Now it's just a fountain, I say, pointing at a stone basin filled with stagnant water. This city is playing tricks on us, Mark concludes. More like a trap, Emily says quietly. What? I ask, turning to look at her. Think about it. The statues, the whispers, David's disappearance, and now this. Emily replies. That's too bizarre, even considering what we've experienced, Katie says, trying to dismiss the idea, but her eyes betray her. She, too, is considering the possibility. Emily walks over to a statue near us with a curious look on her face. Her eyes are locked on its stone arm. The statue's face shows extreme despair, and its eyes seem to be begging for relief from eternal agony. Her hand hovers over the statue's arm as if she's waiting for it to give her a sign. Emily, don't, I shout my voice echoing off the stone walls of the surrounding buildings. But my warning comes too late. The instant Emily's fingers make contact with the stone, her body stiffens like a board. A gasp escapes her mouth, but before it can fully form into a scream, she turns into stone. Her new form captures an expression of horror, making her a permanent part of the city's eerie gallery. Oh my God, Katie cries out, her face going white as she stumbles backward tripping over a loose cobblestone but managing to catch herself before she falls. We need to go now, Mark yells. His face is flushed and his eyes are wide with panic as he grabs my arm, pulling me in the direction we came from. Emily's shocking transformation clarifies the horrifying reality we're facing. This city is not just abandoned, it's a sentient and malevolent force. There's no doubt left in any of us that we are its intended prey. But this realization also instills in me a grim sense of purpose. Now that we understand, even in the crudest sense, what we're up against, we have a chance, however slim, to escape its clutches. Listen, I say, pulling Mark and Katie close to me. We can't touch anything. No more experimentation, no touching the walls, the statues, nothing. We can't try to manipulate the city or engage with it in any way. We just walk, straight, without deviation. Got it? Their faces pale, but their eyes filled with a new, if desperate, resolve. Understood, Mark replies, his voice low but steady. Katie simply nods, gripping her flashlight tightly. Taking this as agreement, I take the lead once more. My eyes are fixated on the horizon, or what passes for a horizon in this unsettling place. We start walking again, our steps synchronized as we move through the labyrinthine streets. Each footfall feels heavy, 
a calculated risk in this enigmatic place. We walk in complete silence, the air around us thick with tension and unsaid fears. Time seems distorted here. Minutes stretch into what feels like hours. The sky remains a constant twilight, offering no clues. Our pace quickens as the silence grows heavier, yet we remain cautious, careful not to disturb the deceptive tranquility of the city any further. And then, just when despair starts to feel like our only companion, a sight for sore eyes emerges. I see it first, the outline of trees, real, living trees in the distance. Look, over there, I point, my voice tinged with a mixture of relief and disbelief. Mark and Katie follow my gaze and see it too. Trees stand tall at the edge of the city, their leaves rustling in the wind, as if it's calling us. They form a clear boundary between this cursed, sentient place and the world we come from, the world we are desperate to return to. A collective sigh of relief escapes our lips. Though we're not out yet, the sight of the forest gives us renewed hope and the will to push forward. We quicken our pace but remain as quiet and respectful as ever, not daring to defy the city that has already taken so much from us. We're almost there, Mark mutters, his voice barely rising above a whisper, as though he's afraid that the very stones beneath our feet might hear him and retaliate. Ahead of us, the cobblestone street comes to an end, giving way to the inviting texture of earth and grass. A boundary, both physical and metaphorical, is between the city of malevolent enigma and the welcoming arms of the forest. As we close the remaining distance, Finally, our shoes leave the hard cobblestones and meet the soft soil of the forest floor. Breaking into the forest, we start running to get away as fast as possible, and don't stop until the city is well behind us. Finally, panting and exhausted, we collapse onto the forest ground. Our electronic devices, previously useless, buzz back to life. We need to alert the authorities, Mark says, immediately dialing a number. They answer, but we find ourselves at a loss when asked for the location. How do you pinpoint a place that doesn't wish to be found? Search parties are sent out and aerial surveys are conducted, but the lost city remains hidden. No trace of it can be found, as if it vanished into thin air or never existed at all. Yet no one can explain what happened. We're labeled as survivors, but the truth gnaws at us. We left Emily and David behind. In the dead of night I find myself staring at the photos we took, especially those of the inscriptions. Despite numerous attempts, no one can translate them, but I don't need a translation. I know they were a warning, one that we failed to understand until it was too late. The city's enigma lingers. It remains hidden, its location a mystery, its existence a question mark. But one thing is clear, the city chooses who enters and who leaves. We were lucky or perhaps unlucky to leave with our lives, but forever branded by the inexplicable horrors of a city lost in both time and space. My name is Emily, and I'm sharing a train compartment with my sister, Nicole. We chose seats facing forward so we could easily appreciate the scenery. We've looked forward to this mountain train ride for weeks, carving out time from our work schedules to make it happen. The train itself is modern, with cushioned seats and clean windows that provide an unobstructed view. Wow, this is stunning, isn't it? Nicole asks. She leans closer to the window her eyes scanning the ever-changing view, her face is relaxed, a clear sign that she is enjoying this experience. Absolutely. Just what we needed, I affirm, feeling a similar sense of peace. The train continues to move at a steady pace, its wheels humming quietly on the steel tracks. Nicole and I share a love for nature, and this trip serves as both a break from everyday life and a chance to reconnect with the outdoors. Outside, the landscape transforms as we move valleys give way to peaks, and forests are punctuated by waterfalls. The sky overhead is a vibrant blue setting off the green of the trees and the gray of the rocky mountain faces. The train's interior complements the natural setting. It's designed with comfortable furnishings, simple yet functional. Overhead compartments store our small bags packed with essentials and snacks for the journey. Nicole pulls out a bag of trail mix, offering me some. I take a handful, savoring the mix of nuts and dried fruit. Compartment isn't crowded, which adds to our sense of privacy and relaxation. Other passengers are equally captivated by the landscape, some taking pictures with their phones, others simply sitting in contemplative silence. 
The quiet sound of conversation is interspersed with the click-clack of camera shutters. As we share this moment, Nicole and I acknowledge that the trip is living up to our expectations. It's an opportunity to pause, to break free from daily obligations, and to simply be present in a setting that captivates us both. Suddenly, the train's speed drops. The wheels make a grinding sound as it slows down. Confused, Nicole and I exchange glances. We feel the train come to a full stop. Looking out, we see a small station with a wooden platform. It's flanked by two dark, long tunnels on either side. The setting feels like a scene from a fantasy novel, but with a more unsettling atmosphere. Do you think this is a sightseeing stop? It doesn't look like any of the stations on the map, Nicole questions. She furrows her brows, clearly puzzled. I'm not sure, but let's go find out. The train should stay here for a few minutes at least, I respond. Eager to explore, we unbuckle our seatbelts and make our way to the train door. As it opens, we feel a rush of cool, unfamiliar air. We step onto the platform, our shoes making a soft thud on the wood. As Nicole and I step onto the station, our eyes immediately adjust to the unique environment. The platform itself is made of worn, dark wood that creaks slightly under our weight. It's devoid of the usual amenities, no benches, no signs, no ticket machines. Rusty rails edge the platform, with tracks that extend into the mouths of two foreboding tunnels at either end. The walls of the tunnels are roughly made from the mountain stone and disappear into darkness, giving off a feeling of endlessness. The air is tinged with a peculiar scent, neither fresh nor foul, but something indistinct that we can't quite identify. It's cool, but not cold, and it seems to hang still, as if time here moves differently. There are no other sounds except for the soft wind that whistles through the tunnels and rustles the alien foliage surrounding the station. Turning our gaze from the station, the surrounding landscape captivates us. The sky is a uniform shade of lavender, devoid of sun, moon, or clouds. The light is soft and diffused, casting no shadows on the ground. The vegetation around the station is unlike anything we've ever seen. Plants with luminous green leaves are juxtaposed with flowers that have metallic-looking petals. The ground is covered in a kind of moss that seems to softly glow, illuminating the area with an eerie luminescence. No trees are in sight, only these strange low-lying plants. Overall, the atmosphere is one of surreal stillness. Everything is still and quiet, except for the subtle movements of the strange plants, as if breathing to the rhythm of this otherworldly place. The environment feels both dreamlike and nightmarish, fascinating and unsettling. It becomes clear that this station and everything around it doesn't belong to the world we know. Emily, look at this. The leaves on this plant are purple, Nicole calls out. She's bent over a short bush-like plant with velvety leaves. Each leaf is a deep shade of purple that almost glows in the soft light. Yeah, and have you noticed the sky? It's lavender. Since when is the sky lavender? I point upward, my finger tracing the surreal color that blankets us. The sky is not just a lighter purple, it's specifically lavender. The feeling of unease grows inside me, mixing with my curiosity. Before we can go deeper into this strange place, the sound of mechanical gears and a hiss breaks the silence. We turn our heads in unison toward the source of the noise. The train doors are sliding shut, automatically sealing the compartments. Our eyes widen in disbelief. In the next second, the train starts to move, its wheels slowly gaining traction on the tracks. The soft thud of wheels against metal becomes louder, and within moments the train is picking up speed. We stand there, rooted to the spot, watching as the train that brought us here retreats into the tunnel. Leaving us alone in this unsettling station, we skid to a halt, gasping for air. Frantically, I pull my phone from my pocket, intending to call for help. I met with the frustrating sight of no service displayed at the top. Nicole, my phone's not working. How about yours? She quickly retrieves her phone from her back pocket, glances at the screen, and then gives me a resigned shake of her head. No signal. What is going on? Her voice shakes, clearly as puzzled and concerned as I am. We both take a moment to really look around taking in each bizarre detail of our surroundings. The absence of any familiar sounds amplifies the eerie silence, making it almost tangible. Even the air feels different, as if it's thicker or filled with something unidentifiable. The sky overhead, 
painted in that unworldly shade offers no clues, no comfort. Equally unsettling are the peculiar plants around us, their purple leaves and metallic petals looking almost animated in the soft light. Nicole, I don't think we're where we're supposed to be. I think this place is well. It's not our world, I say, my words heavy with the unease that has been growing inside me. I look at her, trying to gauge her reaction. As I wrestle with the strangeness that envelops us, I was thinking the same thing, she replies, her eyes meeting mine, her face is pale, almost matching the strange color of the sky. It's like we've stepped into another dimension or something. We stand there for a moment, each grappling with the reality of what she's just said. The words, another dimension, hang in the air between us, as concrete as the wooden platform under our feet. Neither of us knows what to do next. Here we are, stranded at a station that defies all logic and explanation. We have no way to reach out for help. Our phones are useless hunks of metal and glass here. Even the concept of time seems useless. We have no way to tell if or when another train might arrive to take us back. The scope of our situation sinks in, pushing down on us like a physical weight. I can't believe we're doing this. But what choice do we have? Nicole and I start walking cautiously away from the platform, our eyes darting around to take in this bizarre dimension we've stepped into. As Nicole and I continue to walk, the subtle heat from the ground seems to rise around us, contrasting with the cooler air above. My ears pick up a low, rhythmic sound, almost like chimes carried by the wind. Except there's no wind here. The air is stagnant. Nicole then points to something in the sky. Look at that moon or moons. I follow her gaze and see that she's right. Above us are two moons, close to each other but distinctly separate, casting their own individual beams of light. They weren't there when we first arrived. One is a pale blue and the other is a sharp silver. They hang low in the lavender sky as if watching us. We come across what appears to be a stream, but instead of water, a thick transparent gel-like substance is flowing. Nicole dips her fingers in it and immediately pulls them out. It's cold, really cold, she says, shaking her hand to dissipate the sensation. The scent in the air changes, becoming slightly more acidic, a little like the smell of burning leaves in the fall. Nicole wrinkles her nose. It's getting stronger, isn't it? Yes, and it's a bit disorienting, I reply. I also notice that the chime-like sounds are becoming louder and more frequent, almost as if we're approaching their source. Suddenly my eyes catch movement on the periphery. I see shapes in the distance hard to make out, but they are definitely moving. As they come closer, it's clear that these are not any animals we know. They are quadrupedal, but have too many joints on their legs, making their movement look like a continuous series of unfolding motions. Their skin, or maybe it's a shell, is dark red and segmented. Their heads are triangular and I can't see any eyes. As Nicole and I continue our cautious journey, we come across foliage that looks like a hybrid between a fern and a mushroom. The leaves are broad and flat, but have spores on the underside. They sway lightly, even though there's no breeze to speak of. Yeah, I see it, Nicole says, nodding toward the peculiar foliage. It's like the rules of biology just don't apply here. My attention is caught by the ground we're walking on. It's no longer the spongy orange material, but has now turned into something resembling sand, except each grain is perfectly spherical and has a metallic sheen. The sensation underfoot is like walking on tiny ball bearings, providing an odd mixture of slip and grip. Be careful, I warn Nicole as she nearly stumbles, catching her balance at the last moment. We're about to move on when Nicole spots something else hovering in the air. What is that? She murmurs, pointing at a floating object about the size of a basketball. It's translucent, like a soap bubble, but its surface is constantly shifting with colors I can't even name. No idea, I answer, but let's keep our distance. We navigate around the hypnotic water feature and the strange creatures we've already seen, finally coming upon an area that feels slightly more familiar. It looks like a field, though the grass is a shade of pale purple and stands perfectly straight up as if reaching for the sky. As we walk through the field, I hear what seems to be a distant melody, like wind chimes but far softer, more melodic. Do you hear that? I ask Nicole. Yeah, she replies, her face showing a mixture of wonder and confusion. 
It's beautiful, but also unsettling. Our attention is suddenly drawn back to the immediate danger when we hear a low growl. New creatures emerge from the strange vegetation surrounding the field. These beings have elongated snouts and multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth that are clearly visible even from a distance. Their eyes are deep black and their fur, if it can be called that, appears to be a swirl of shadows constantly moving on their bodies. This isn't good, Nicole whispers, clutching my arm tightly. I grip her arm in return and we both hold our breath, hearts pounding. Thankfully, the menacing creatures don't seem interested in us. They glance our way but quickly continue on their path, disappearing into another patch of bizarre foliage. Then Nicole and I notice a sudden change in the creature's behavior around us. The ones with too many limbs and the first world beings all start to move in the same direction, away from something. Even the strange foliage seems to contract as if bracing itself. Do you feel that? Nicole asks, her voice tinged with concern. I do. A subtle vibration is spreading through the ground. It's not strong, but it's enough to notice, like the soft tremors before something bigger arrives. I look at Nicole and our eyes meet, both filled with a mix of curiosity and fear. Then we see it. Emerging from behind a rise in the landscape is a creature so massive and strange, it defies immediate comprehension. It has a long tubular body that stretches easily the length of a bus, but is thicker. Its skin is a constantly changing collection, blues, greens, purples, and reds. The colors change so rapidly that it's almost dizzying to look at. The creature moves on what must be dozens of legs, each jointed in multiple places and tipped with a complex appendage that looks like a cross between a claw and a hoof. As it moves, the ground under its legs appears to move and bubble, as though it's not solid. Perhaps most unsettling of all, the creature has no discernible eyes, just an array of tentacle-like appendages sprouting from the front of its body. These wave in the air as it moves, as if it's tasting the atmosphere, sensing vibrations, or doing who knows what else. We need to hide, I say, the words barely more than a whisper. Nicole nods, and we both make a dash toward a cluster of the glowing rock formations. The light might give us away, but the rocks offer the only cover available. We squeeze ourselves into a narrow space between two of the luminescent structures, our backs pressed against the glowing surface. It's warm to the touch and casts a strange pattern of light and shadow over us. The large creature is drawing closer, its legs making a rhythmic, thudding sound that grows louder with each step, intensifying the vibration in the ground. We hold our breath, trying to make ourselves as small as possible. The creature stops near the rock formation where we are hiding its appendages extending toward the rocks and then retracting. For a moment we think it's going to move on, but then one of its appendages extends directly toward our hiding spot. Just inches from us, it suddenly halts, pulls back, and then the creature turns away from us. As it moves in the opposite direction, the smaller creatures start to return and the tension in the air eases. We wait a few more minutes before daring to leave our hiding spot. That was too close, Nicole says, her voice shaky. After that unsettling experience, we start to make our way back toward the station, our pace quicker than before. We're almost there when we hear it, the distant but unmistakable sound of a train horn echoing in the distance. It's the most beautiful sound we've heard since arriving in this unsettling place. I grab Nicole's arm, grip tightening as I say, we have to go, now, is already forming on our foreheads, evidence of the nervous energy we both feel. We both sprint our shoes hitting the orange spongy ground with a sound that's almost squishy. Every step sinks slightly, as if the earth itself is trying to slow us down. Our hearts are practically leaping out of our chests, keeping rhythm with our quick steps. The looming urgency makes us hyper aware of our surroundings. We dodge around peculiar plant-like formations that are neither trees nor bushes, their foliage a mix of colors we've never seen before. The train horn blares again, a haunting sound that carries over the strange landscape, filling the air and shaking us to our core. It's closer now, and it's do or die. We find ourselves leaping over ridges that look like they were formed from dripped wax. Their surfaces are waxy and smooth but solid enough to support our weight. Then we reach a clearing where the ground seems to be covered in a liquid that's unlike any water we've ever seen. It's dark, almost black, and appears to move in patterns forming spirals that seem to move of their own accord. 
Our breaths come out in short, quick puffs, visible in the cool air as we push our bodies to their limits. The train horn sounds one more time, but now it's so close that it almost feels like it's driving us to move faster than we thought possible. Shortcut through there, Nicole's voice is tinged with urgency as she points to a narrow passage framed by two massive translucent structures that resemble crystals. The gap looks like it could save us time, but it's also completely unknown territory. Do we have a choice? Go, I respond, my eyes meeting hers for a brief second before we both dart toward the gap. As we rush into the passage, the strange nature of this place becomes even more apparent. The walls aren't just see-through, they're pulsating slowly, emitting uneven bursts of pale, iridescent light. It's as if the walls have a life force of their own, but now's not the time to ponder the mysteries of this world. Our focus is solely on getting through as quickly as possible. The ground within the passage is surprisingly smooth compared to the uneven terrain we've been navigating, but I notice it's also more slippery, as if coated with some kind of film. We have to adjust our strides to maintain our speed without losing balance. Just as we think we're about to clear this tight space, we almost stumble over a cluster of creepy, tentacled creatures. They're strange beings, almost resembling oversized insects, but with undulating appendages that give them a marine-like appearance. Oddly enough, they don't seem interested in us this time. Their tentacles retract close to their bodies as they scatter in different directions. This unnerves us both, but we don't have the luxury of stopping to question it. We're back into the more familiar, yet still alien landscape, and we continue our desperate dash toward the station. We're getting close. I can hear it. Nicole's voice is almost shrill, with a mix of excitement and desperation. The sound of the train isn't just audible now. It's resonating in our chests and vibrating through the odd, spongy ground. As we come over the crest of a final ridge, our eyes lock onto our destination, the station's platform. But reaching it isn't a done deal. The train's horn blares again, much closer now, sounding like it's practically upon us. Summoning every last reserve of energy, we kick it into high gear. Our arms are swinging in exaggerated arcs, trying to generate more speed, while our lungs work overtime, pulling in quick, shallow breaths of the cool alien air. There it is. Come on, Emily. A little bit more. Nicole's words serve as both encouragement and a reality check. The train is visible now. The station is just a few steps away now. With a final burst of speed, we close the remaining distance. Our feet make solid contact with the wooden planks of the platform, sending a jolt of relief through us just as the train glides smoothly into the station. We quickly move to the spot where we think the train doors will open, standing side by side in tense anticipation. The train's metallic screech fills the air as it comes to a halt in front of us. Nicole and I position ourselves right where we expect the doors to open. I can't shake the nagging feeling that we're not safe yet, but for a moment I allow myself to breathe a sigh of relief. We've made it this far, haven't we? Just as that thought crosses my mind, I hear it a guttural growl that turns my blood to ice. We both whip our heads around and see one of those nightmarish creatures emerge from behind a towering crystal structure. It's bigger than the others we've seen. Its scales shimmering and changing colors as it moves. Its eyes lock onto us, and it lets out another terrifying growl before charging. Emily, get ready, Nicole shouts, grabbing a loose rock from the ground. We have to keep it away from us. Just long enough for those doors to open, I respond, grabbing a rock. The creature is fast, its numerous limbs carrying it toward us at a frightening speed. Nicole launches her rock first, hitting it square in one of its many eyes. The creature stumbles, emitting a sound somewhere between a roar and a screech. I seize the moment to hurl my rock, striking it on its flank. It recoils, giving us precious seconds as a chime sounds from the train. The doors are opening. Run now, I scream, and we bolt for the train. We're so close, just a few feet away from the open doors. My legs feel like they are on fire, every muscle screaming in protest, but I push through it, with a leap that feels like it takes an eternity. We both land inside the train compartment. No sooner have our feet touched the floor, then the doors slide closed behind us. The train jerks into motion and we stumble, but manage to grab onto the handrails to steady ourselves. I turn to look out the window, just in time to see the creature stop at the edge of the it looks at us with what I swear is a glare, its eyes narrowing as if it understands it has lost its prey. 
The train picks up speed, leaving the creature and that hellish landscape behind, becoming smaller and smaller until they're just blurs in the distance. Nicole and I slump into the empty seats, gasping for air. We're sweaty and dirty and our hands are shaking, but we're also overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude. We look at each other and it hits us both at the same time. We've escaped. We've actually escaped. For the first time since this nightmare began, I feel my body start to relax. I lean back in the seat, close my eyes, and take a deep breath. The adrenaline is starting to wear off, replaced by a fatigue that reaches down to my very bones. The train glides smoothly through a scenic mountain range, and as I look out the window, I realize how different this is from the otherworldly landscape we've just escaped from. It's comforting in its familiarity. Trees, rocks, and flowing rivers, all behaving just like they should, not a pulsating crystal or shape-shifting creature in sight. Nicole sits across from me, her eyes meeting mine. Do you think it was all a dream? she asks, her voice tinged with disbelief. I shake my head, too real to be a dream. But maybe that's something we keep between us. I mean, who would believe us? She nods, pulling her phone out of her bag. Oh, look, signal's back, she says, eyes widening as notifications flood her screen. I check my own phone. Sure enough, the signal is strong, and messages from friends and family are pouring in. For a moment, the normality of it all feels almost foreign. I open a text for Mom asking where we are. I quickly type out that we're on our way, and we'll explain everything soon. My fingers hover over the send button, contemplating whether to add something about the unbelievable experience we've just had. In the end, I decide against it. Some things are too unbelievable, even for a text message. The train begins to slow as it approaches the final station. I grip the handle of my bag, suddenly aware of the weight of our experience. We stand up and walk toward the door, bracing ourselves for the change yet again. But this time it's a return to the familiar rather than a plunge into the unknown. The doors slide open and we step off the train. The station is bustling with people going about their daily lives. Completely unaware of the mind-bending journey we've just been through. It's a stark contrast and it makes everything that's happened feel even more surreal. Back to reality, Nicole says softly as we make our way through the crowd. I nod but can't help but feel that our reality has been permanently altered. We're back in our world, yes, but we've seen things that we can't unsee and experienced fears we didn't know we had. As we exit the station, I spot our parents' car in the pickup area. The moment we get in, they pepper us with questions. Where were we? Are we okay? Why didn't we answer our phones? We got lost, Nicole answers, her voice steady. We're okay, though, just tired and glad to be back. Yeah, I add, locking eyes with her for a moment. Really glad. I lean my head back against the seat and close my eyes. The familiar sounds of the city fill the air, horns honking, people talking, the sounds of life as we know it. And yet, in the middle of it all, I can still hear the distant sounds of that other world. Nicole reaches over and squeezes my hand and I squeeze back. We're both thankful to be back, yet scarred in ways that words can't describe. But for now, we're home, and that's enough. It has to be. It was a warm, sunny day in October when I decided to take a solo hike through the dense forest behind my family's cabin. The vibrant autumn foliage painted the landscape in a breathtaking palette of reds, oranges, and yellows. Little did I know that my day would end in terror. As I trekked deeper into the woods, I stumbled upon an old, hidden trail. Curiosity piqued, I decided to venture down this new path. The farther I went, the more the forest seemed to close in around me casting a shadow of unease over my journey. After hours of walking, the trail led me to a clearing with an enormous, wind-outless concrete building. Razor wire fences and security cameras surrounded the structure. A faded sign above the entrance read, Restricted Area, Authorized Personnel Only. My heart raced as I stared at the Amis building, a sense of dread creeping over me. Despite my instincts screaming at me to turn back, I couldn't resist the allure of discovering what lay within. Finding a weak spot in the fence, I squeezed through and approached the entrance. The door was locked, but an open vent at the base of the wall offered a point of entry. I crawled through the dark, claustrophobic space, 
my breath shallow and shaky. I emerged in a dimly lit hallway lined with heavy metal doors. The air was stale and a low hum vibrated through the walls. It felt like the building was alive, pulsating with some kind of unnatural energy. I cautiously opened the nearest door, revealing a small room with a single chair in the center. A strange machine was mounted to the wall, its purpose unclear. I felt it shiver down my spine and closed the door, moving on to the next room. This one contained a row of glass chambers, each housing a human figure suspended in a viscous green liquid. I gasped in horror as I realized these people were part of some monstrous experiment. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was in a place where the line between life and death was blurred. As I moved through the facility, I came across several rooms where different experiments were being performed. Each room was more horrifying than the last, revealing the depths to which the government was willing to go in their attempts to contact the afterlife. In one room I saw a team of scientists huddle around a large glass chamber. Inside a man was strapped to a table, electrodes attached to his temples. His eyes were wide with terror and his body convulsed as electric currents surged through him. I could see his brain activity spike and then plummet, as if they were trying to push him to the brink of death and bring him back again over and over. I could only imagine the agony he was experiencing, trapped between life and death. Another room contained an even more chilling sight. Here a group of individuals lay on gurneys, their heads encased in strange, helmet-like devices. Tudes connected the helmets to a massive machine that emitted a low, ominous hum. As I watched, the expressions on the subjects' faces shifted from serenity to sheer terror. It was as though they were being forced to experience nightmarish visions of the afterlife, their minds subjected to unimaginable horrors. I also came across a room that appeared to be a laboratory dedicated to the study of psychic phenomena. Several subjects sat in chairs, their heads encased in metallic helmets connected to a network of computers. They stared blankly ahead, their faces conked and pale. Scientists scrutinized the data on the screens, seemingly oblivious to the suffering of the test subjects. I couldn't help but shudder at the implications of what they were trying to achieve, harnessing psychic powers to breach the barrier between life and death. In the final room I saw something that will haunt me for the rest of my days. A large cylindrical tank stood in the center of the room, filled with a murky, swirling liquid. As I approached, I could see a figure suspended within, its features obscured by the fluid. The room was filled with a hum of machinery, and I noticed a series of cables connected to the tank, pulsating with energy. As I watched, the liquid began to churn violently, and the figure within seemed to twist and contort unnaturally. Suddenly, the room was filled with an ear-splitting scream emanating from the tank. The scientists in the room seemed unfazed, scribbling notes and adjusting dials on the equipment. I couldn't bear to watch any longer, and I flood the room, the screens echoing in my mind. These were the horrifying experiments I witnessed within the secret government facility, each one more disturbing than the last. It was clear that they were willing to go to any length that unlocked the secrets of the afterlife, no matter the human cost. A sudden piercing alarm blared through the building. Panic surged through me, and I knew I had to escape. I retraced my steps back to the vent, but hesitated as I heard footsteps approaching. I knew I couldn't risk being seen, so I slipped into the shadows, pressing myself against the cold, unforgiving walls. The sound of the footsteps grew closer, and I held my breath, praying they wouldn't spot me. As the footsteps faded into the distance, I noticed a map of the facility and a wall nearby. I quickly scanned it for an alternate escape road as falling upon a series of underground tunnels used for waste disposal. It was risky, but it was my best shot at getting out undetected. I located the nearest access point and made my way there, avoiding security cameras and patrols along the way. The tunnel entrance was hidden behind a metal grate, which I managed to pry open with a discarded crowbar I found nearby. I descended into the darkness, the stench of decay and chemicals assaulting my senses. The tunnel was narrow and dank, but I crawled through the filth driven by the desperate need to escape. As I made my way through the maze-like tunnels, I heard the muffled sounds of pursuit above me. They were searching for me, but I hoped the tunnels would lead me far enough away from the facility to evade capture. After what felt like an eternity, I saw a faint light of a head. It was the exit. 
I crawled faster, my heart pounding in anticipation, but as I approached the exit, I heard the distant rumble of an approaching vehicle. I had to act quickly. I emerged from the tunnel, finding myself on the edge of the forest. The sounds of pursuit were growing closer, so I scrambled up a nearby tree, concealing myself in the foliage just as a patrol vehicle pulled up to the tunnel exit. The armed men exited the vehicle and began to search the area, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. I waited in terror, my heart palming as I clutched the branches, praying they would look up. After a tense few minutes, the men returned to their vehicle, apparently convinced that I had eluded them. The vehicle roared away and I allowed myself a moment to breathe. Once I was sure they were gone, I climbed down from the tree and began the long, treacherous journey back to my cabin. I moved cautiously through the woods, avoiding the main trails, and using my knowledge of the area to stay hidden. With every step I felt the weight of what I had discovered bearing down on me, but the fear of being caught propelled me forward. I knew I could never truly be safe. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments, so feel free to share. If you're enjoying the content and would like to support the channel, consider subscribing and hitting the like button. It would greatly help us in delivering more new content.